So in this video, we're going to talk about the physics of the stratosphere and try and explain why it has that peculiar temperature profile that we saw it having last time. Now, if you didn't see that last video, if you just like a refresher, then you can click the link up here. Now, in order to talk about the stratosphere, we actually need to start talking about the sun. Now, the sun, in case you haven't noticed, is hot. Like, really, really hot. It's the source of almost all energy of all the planets in the solar system, and the Earth is no exception. The way in which the sun transmits energy to Earth is through a mechanism called radiation. Now, when most people think of radiation, they think of alpha, beta particles, gamma particles, all these really nasty things that are given off by radioactive sources. But what means in a general physics context is rather different. When we talk about radiation, what we really mean is electromagnetic radiation, or EM radiation. Now, visible light is an example of EM radiation, as are the gamma rays that I talked about earlier, and also the heat coming off of a fire. They're all forms of electromagnetic radiation, but they're different because they have different wavelengths. Radiation is transmitted from one point to another as a wave, and so has a wavelength associated with it as well as an amplitude, in exactly the same way that a water wave has a wavelength and an amplitude associated with it. The difference with EM radiation, though, is that while water waves need, well, water to move through, electromagnetic radiation doesn't need a substance to move through. It can go through a vacuum like space. And the reason for this is that it moves its waves through a much more fundamental medium, which is the electromagnetic field, but that's a discussion for another time. The point is that electromagnetic radiation can have a whole bunch of different wavelengths, and we display these wavelengths on the electromagnetic spectrum. The sun transmits energy at a whole bunch of different wavelengths, and we can actually see what wavelengths it emits at by looking at its spectrum. And what we can see by comparing it to the electromagnetic spectrum is that it transmits mostly in the ultraviolet and the thermal bands. Now, this explains why the sun appears so hot to us. When it's in the day, it feels hot when the sun shines on you because it's emitting a lot of thermal radiation. And between thermal and ultraviolet bands, of course, is visible light. That's why the sun's so bright. Radiation is thrown off by the sun in every direction, and the Earth absorbs some of it. Now, most of that radiation passes straight through the Earth's atmosphere and gets absorbed by the planet itself. And by absorbing the energy that was transmitted by that radiation, the Earth heats up and starts to emit radiation of its own. And its emission profile looks like this. The crucial thing to notice here is that the Earth transmits energy at longer wavelengths than the sun does. Now, this is because Longer wavelength radiation carries less energy than short wavelength radiation, and the amount of energy that an object gives out due to thermal radiation is proportional to how hot it is. So the sun is very hot, it emits a lot of energy, and so it emits that energy primarily at shorter wavelengths, where the Earth, which is much cooler than the sun, emits less energy, and so transmits it at longer wavelengths. And while the short wavelength radiation given off by the sun passes straight through the atmosphere from the top down to the surface. The Earth's radiation that gets emitted, which comes from the surface and goes through the atmosphere and out into space, gets a much rougher treatment, because it turns out that the Earth's atmosphere is very, very good at absorbing long wavelength radiation. Now, what determines if a particular substance is good or bad at absorbing a particular wavelength of radiation is a rather complex series of interactions that involves the number of atoms in the molecule and their electrons. But what's important here is that, as you might remember from the first video, 99% of the Earth's atmosphere is O2 and N2, oxygen and nitrogen. And both of those molecules have two atoms apiece. And having two atoms in those molecules renders them very effective at absorbing long wavelength radiation. This absorption of the thermal wavelengths, the long wavelength radiation, from the Earth's surface by nitrogen and oxygen in the atmosphere results in the atmosphere, at least to begin with, getting cooler the higher you go, due to absorption of that radiation and then subsequent, slightly weaker re-emission. By emitting slightly less radiation than it absorbs, a particular layer in the atmosphere warms slightly by the first law of thermodynamics. And by attenuating or reducing subsequently with each layer the amount of radiation which reaches higher levels of the atmosphere, there's less energy available to be converted into thermal energy. And so the atmosphere cools or gets cooler the higher you go. 
Now let's look back at the temperature profile that we saw in the first video. In the troposphere and the mesosphere, we see this profile that we're expecting, that the Earth's atmosphere gets cooler the higher you go. But in the stratosphere, we're seeing the exact opposite. It's getting warmer. So we're obviously missing something. And we're missing a really important part of the stratospheric system. We're missing ozone. Ozone is a molecule formed of three oxygen atoms and it's found in huge abundance in the middle stratosphere, though it's by no means the dominant gas in those areas. And the fact that it's formed of three atoms instead of the two of nitrogen and oxygen means that it has different absorption properties. And in particular, it means that it's not so great at absorbing the long wavelength radiation that the Earth emits, but it's really good at absorbing the short wavelength radiation that the Sun emits. What this means is that the ozone in the stratosphere absorbs some of the short wavelength radiation coming in from the sun. And by the first law of thermodynamics, by doing so, it heats up. And by having hot ozone, you have warm air in the rest of the stratosphere. And this combined with the rest of the gases in the stratosphere, so the nitrogen and the oxygen, interacting with the long wavelength radiation from the surface of the earth, combines to form the temperature profile that we see, what we call a temperature inversion. But exactly how ozone absorbs the short wavelength radiation from the sun is quite interesting, and it taps into a global problem from the past century. Because the specific short wavelength of radiation that ozone is very good at absorbing has another name. It's ultraviolet radiation, and the UVB band to be specific. Now, UVB is important because, well, it's not very good for us. A prolonged exposure to UVB can result in cataracts and all manner of different cancers. And so the ozone layer is actually a very important shield for us on the surface of the planet. The ozone layer prevents this harmful UVB radiation from reaching the surface. And so it's in our best interest to maintain a healthy ozone layer that blocks the, the UVB out. But um, we haven't really been doing that. For the most part of the 20th century, humans have been emitting chemicals called chlorofluorocarbons or CFCs, and CFCs disrupt the very delicately balanced cycle by which ozone is created in the atmosphere called the Chapman cycle. And by doing so, it's been depleting the amount of ozone in the atmosphere. And you might have heard about this, the ozone hole over the South Pole was of significant cause of concern because our shield from harmful radiation was being damaged and potentially was gonna be destroyed forever. Mercifully, however, in a surprising case of environmental news being good and not being reported, the ozone layer is currently healing. And this is because various protocols in the late 80s and early 90s successfully banned the production and emission of CFCs. And hopefully that's going to be a precedent for future environmental action on a global scale such as climate change. But for now, the ozone in the Earth's atmosphere is going to be returning to pre-industrial levels by sometime in the mid 21st century. So in this video we've covered radiation concepts, how energy is emitted by different objects at different wavelengths depending on how hot they are, with hotter objects giving off more energy in the form of short wavelength radiation. We've covered the absorption of long wavelength radiation by the nitrogen and oxygen in the Earth's atmosphere, the absorption of short wavelength radiation by ozone in the Earth's stratosphere, and how humans nearly messed up that system completely. In the next video, we're going to be looking to the poles to cover the physics of the scary sounding stratospheric polar vortex, the single largest feature in the stratosphere. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this video, then please give it a like and consider subscribing to this channel for more educational content. Basically, reading them in detail and writing them up in uh, scientific language called LaTeX. It's a scientific typesetting language which makes everything look really gorgeous. It's going to be what I'll write my thesis in.